Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and this is the third video in my tutorial series explaining how to use Asterisk PBX to create a playful telephone network uh, suitable for use in escape rooms or something like that. Now, at the end of the last video, we got to the point where we've got the Asterisk server up and running on a Raspberry Pi, uh, you've created some extension numbers, and those extensions are mapped either to physical phone handsets like this, or perhaps to virtual soft phone clients running on a PC on the network. And you can make and receive calls uh, between those clients by dialing the relevant extension number. Now, in this video, what I want to do is to extend that concept a bit more. We're going to create some more extension numbers, but these ones aren't going to be assigned to telephones. Instead, they're going to be endpoints in the system that you can dial and we're going to make something happen when that extension is dialed. So they might run a script, they might play back a recorded message, they might call some text-to-speech software, or they might run some conditional logic to uh, load or save a file to increase the value of a variable or something like that. Okay, so let's get started. So in the last video, we set up the extension numbers using a web front end called FreePBX. And um, that lets you connect to the Raspberry Pi from the browser on your PC and gives you like some nice graphical options to set up extension numbers and uh, usernames and passwords and all things like that. For this video, because we're doing some slightly more uh, complex functionality, what we're going to do is we're actually going to be writing the rules in code instead. So I've loaded up uh, Visual Studio on my PC. Um, you can use any text editor you want. There's nothing particularly special about this. And what we're going to do is we're going to be writing um, some rules which are going to go into Asterisk's dial plan. So the dial plan is the set of rules that Asterisk uses to determine how to route calls going through the network. Now, when we added our extensions through FreePBX, uh, so we had an extension number 1000, and we mapped that to a rotary phone. We had another extension 2000, and we mapped that to a virtual phone. And then when those numbers are dialed, <clears throat> FreePBX added them to the dial plan. So Asterisk knows how to route those calls and to make those extension numbers uh, call each other. Now what we're going to do is we're going to manually add some features to the dial plan. So the syntax for this is a little bit um, uh, confusing if you haven't seen it before. So I'm going to do the first example slowly and just sort of talk through each line and then I'm going to show you more complex examples as we work on. So the first sort of bit of terminology you need to get the hang of is something called the context. And context is a bit like um, it's saying the sort of the, the, the group that this set of rules belongs to. And it tells it when this rule is going to be followed. So the context we're going to use for our first um, extension that we're adding to the dial plan is called the from internal custom context. So this is a custom context because it's something that we're adding. It wasn't built into the system. And it's from internal because that means that this rule is going to be followed when a call is made from another internal extension number on the network. So it means you can dial this number from any of the extensions on the network and this rule will be followed, okay? So that's called the context. The next line is going to actually assign the extension number that's going to be used for this rule. So we write extend and then a little kind of arrow like that. And um, the next uh, number we type is going to be the actual extension we're going to use. So let's use a number we haven't used yet. Uh, let's use uh, 5555, let's say. Okay. Now, the rules are going to be followed in order. And this is going to be the first rule. So we're going to write a common number one. That's called the priority. So the first instruction in a context is always going to be the number one priority thing to do. And what are we going to do? What's the first priority action we want to take when this extension is run? Well, we want to answer the call. Okay, so that's our complete first line. Um, so when the extension number 5555 is rung, the first thing we want to do is answer the call. Okay, now what do we want to happen next? Well, um, we haven't yet saved a sound file or anything like that, but we need to have some way of knowing that um, 
this call has been successfully received. And fortunately, Asterix does come with some sound files built into it. So let's play back a sound file, because that's quite a useful thing to do. So we're now going to write uh, extend again. And it's still going to be the same extension number. But this time, this is going to be the second priority rule that we're going to follow. So effectively, we're going to write them in, uh, in order what we want to happen every time that this set of instructions is run. And we want to play back a sound file. So there's two commands for this, but the one I'm going to use is called playback. And then you simply type the name of the uh, file that you want to play. So in this case, I know that there is one built into the system, which is the lyrics to the song Louie Louie. So I'm going to play back that sound file. And then the last instruction, having played back that sound file, 5555, five, 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 the third instruction, we want to hang up the call. OK, so that is our first rule. We're going to, when the number 5555 five, five, five is rung from an internal extension number, we're going to answer it, we're going to play back a sound file, and then we're going to hang up. So I'm now going to save this uh, file here, and I'm going to save it with this file name. So it's extensions underscore custom got dot conf, OK? So that file is now saved to my local PC. And the next thing I need to do is copy it to the Raspberry Pi. So to do that, I'm going to use the WinSCP application, uh, which I mentioned in the first video in this tutorial. Uh, so I'm going to connect to the IP address uh, of my Raspberry Pi. That's 192.168.1.33. And I'm going to connect as the uh, root user. And the default password for that, if you haven't changed it, is Raspberry. And now you'll see uh, a window like this. So this is uh, much like um, most FTP programs, if you've used an FTP program before. On the left-hand pane here, I've got my local uh, PC directory listing. And on the right-hand side, this is the contents of my Raspberry Pi. Uh, so what I want to do is navigate to the uh, etc directory on my Raspberry Pi, and then into the asterisk directory. And you'll see there's lots of uh, files here. And I'm going to copy my extensions underscore custom dot comp file into that directory. Uh, now, I've already got one there because I've used it before. You might not have one if this is the first time you've done it, um, in which case you won't get this message. But simply overwrite a file if it's there. And that's now saved on the Raspberry Pi. Now, there's one more step we have to do, though. Remember when we were using free PBX and I told you about the little red button that appears at the top that said apply config changes? Well, we kind of have to do the same here. We've updated the dial plan, but we need to tell Asterisk to actually reload and use that new uh, version that we've just copied up. Um, now, to do that, we're going to load PuTTY. And remember that uh, PuTTY lets us connect remotely to the command line. Uh, so again, I'll type the uh, IP address of my Raspberry Pi. Open that. And I'm going to log in as the root user again with the password Raspberry, which is the default. And when I get to the command line here, the command I'm going to run is asterisk and then with a dash rx. And then in single quotes, I'm going to run the command dial plan reload. Dial plan reloaded. So what that's done is that's told Asterisk to load those changes, uh, to incorporate those changes that we saved in this file here. And now these will be active on the system. OK, so we've defined a new extension number and given it some rules to follow when that extension is dialed. Uh, we copied that file to the Raspberry Pi, and then we reloaded Asterisk to tell it to use it as part of its dial plan. So now, when we call that number from any telephone in the network, uh, that set of rules should be followed. So let's give it a test. Uh, so I'm going to uh, use my handset here for this example, and I'm just going to dial the number 5555. Five, five. Five, and I'm just going to hold the earpiece up next to the microphone so you can hear this, hopefully. Louie, Louie, me go 
gotta go. Louie, Louie, me gotta go. I'm little girl, she waits for me. Me catch the ship, for cross the sea. Me sail the ship, all alone. Me never sinks. It goes on for quite a while. I think it's the whole song. Um, I'm not quite sure whether you use that as the test file, but there you go. Um, so that's demonstrated the basics of how you can add a new custom extension. Let's go back to our uh, custom extension file now and start to add on some more features. Okay, so let's suppose that you want to do something uh, slightly more useful than simply play back the lyrics of the popular song Louie Louie. Um, so I've come back into the um, extensions custom file and we're going to add a new set of rules here. Uh, so once again, we're going to be using the uh, from internal custom context. So that's going to say that this set of rules can be followed uh, when a call is made from uh, an internal extension number. And exactly like before, we're going to begin by um, specifying the extension number that this rule is going to apply to. Um, so this time I'll just make it 5556, let's say. And the first priority action that's going to happen when that extension is called, oops, trying to type one and then say another word, is we're going to answer the call. There we go, like that. Um, and now for this example, I'm going to do uh, basically the same functionality as we used before, but with a, a custom sound file instead. Um, but I'm going to use a slightly different syntax, a slightly more modern and a slightly more flexible syntax. You'll notice in this example here, we had to repeat um, the extension number on every line. And we also had to explicitly number each line uh, in the order that they're going to be executed, one, two, three. Now, um, there's, a, there's an alternative way you can specify that, though. So rather than repeating the extension number on every line, if the next instruction relates to the same extension number as the one previously, you can just write same instead, like that. And that replaces the need to um, state this extension number explicitly every time. Likewise, if the next instruction is always going to be the one more priority than the one before it, Rather than actually having to manually keep track of what line number you're up to, you can just put the letter N. So that says this: uh, the rule on this line here uses the same extension as before and it is the next priority action. So they're just going to be followed through in the order that they're written. Okay. Um, and we're going to use the uh, playback command again. Um, I'm just going to put brackets but leave that... Uh, blank for a moment. We'll come back and fill that in in a second. And then on the last line, once again, we can use same. And the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to hang up the call. So uh, this here does the same functionality as what we had before. Uh, it's just a slightly neater way of writing it. Um, now we need to write something in uh, this gap here. So before we had um, file here. I'm now going to uh, copy a new sound file to the Raspberry Pi and my um, recording software of choice on a PC is um, Audacity. So I've got a sound file here which um, I got from a free sound archive on the internet. A uh, couple of points to note. First of all it needs to be a mono sound file so only having a single channel. Um, you'll see at the moment it was recorded at uh, 44,000 Hertz and was 32 bits. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce that down to 8,000 hertz. You don't really want um, a high quality sound files. It's a bit of a waste because they're going to be played down a telephone line anyway. Um, so 8,000 hertz is absolutely fine for spoken uh, voices and things like that. And I'm going to save it. Um, so uh, I'm going to save it in this directory here as a 16-bit um, wave file. So just standard wave file, and I'll save it over there as lufandemond.wav. I'll save that there. Uh, it's got some metadata. That's absolutely fine. Okay, so now I've saved that file. What I need to do is to copy it to the uh, Raspberry Pi. So exactly as before, for copying files backwards and forwards, I'm going to use um, the WinSCP. Uh, program. So here's my sound file and this time we need to put it in a slightly different directory. So we're going to go into the var directory and then into lib and then into asterisk 
and sounds. Now, uh, in this directory here, you actually see I've got two subfolders. I've got en and I've got temp. So en is um, English language sound files. Asterisk supports kind of a multi-language option, which means you can have uh, voice prompts recorded in uh, many different languages that support. So you might have uh, French, German, Spanish, um, Italian, whatever languages you've chosen to support in your installation, you might have subfolders here with, with the language code here. I've only got English installed, so I'm going to put my sound files in there. And in here, you'll see that Asterix actually comes with quite a few sound files already. These are mostly used for spoken uh, prompts on the phone. So things like if you're waiting to join a conference call, for example, you'll get a little audible alert or if there's a call waiting or something like that. Um, in fact, if we look down here a bit more, uh, we should find the file that goes with that um, previous test we did. Uh, where was it? Oh, right, here we go, lyrics, Louie Louie. So that was the sound file that we just um, practiced on in the first example. But what we're going to do here, we're going to copy our custom file into the custom subfolder at the top. So that way we know it was a file that we copied on and not one that came with the system. So I'm just going to drag it across to custom. Like that. And then I'm going to go, so I don't need that anymore. I don't need that anymore. I'm going to come back to uh, the raw file here. And so we placed it in the custom subfolder and it was called Le Fan Du Monde. Now, uh, one thing to notice here is you don't include the file extension on the end here for the playback command. So even though the file was called Le Fan Du Monde .wav, uh, ignore the file extension on the end, just put the title in there. And we can now save that. Once again, we now need to copy our new file over. So we need to come back to out of that directory, out of that directory, back to the root. And then we go into etc asterisk and we'll recopy our new extensions.conf over. And lastly, every time you make any change like that and you want it to take effect, you've always got to reload the dial plan as well. So we'll come back to putty and we'll reload the dial plan. Okay, so uh, we have now got our sound file copied over. We've got our new rule written. So I'm now going to test that out. So for this, I'll load up um, Microsit this time, I think, rather than uh, faffing around with the telephone handset each time. And if I dial 5556 and call that number, we should hear our nice polka file. Great. Okay. So, um, so that shows you a slightly, um, a slightly different context, a, a slightly different syntax. Sorry. And uh, it also um, shows how to copy files and reference them. Let's carry on. So now that we've stepped through an example of how to add a new rule into the asterisk dialing plan, what I really want to do now is to show you uh, examples of many of the different functions and features that are built into asterisk. And rather than um, individually type them and copy them up and then show them each time, what I'm going to do is to load a kind of a dialing plan that I made earlier um, that has lots of examples. And I just want to sort of talk through each one and then show them in action running to you. So here's my dialing plan. I've already saved it onto the Raspberry Pi in the etc asterisk directory and I've already reloaded the dialing plan as well. So this will all be live now. Um, so the first example I've got here in the plan, this is the first example I showed you here. I just added some comments. So this is playing back a built-in sound file. And uh, because I haven't specified a directory, that's going to look for that file in the var lib asterisk sounds en directory. OK, so I don't need to show you that again. We've done that one. And the second one, this is a custom sound file. So I've put it in the custom subfolder uh, of this uh, directory here. And I've also just put some notes there. So this is a mono sound file, 8000 hertz, saved as a 16-bit PCM WAV. Okay, let's go on to uh, example three. 
So this uses a new function. Rather than playing back a pre-recorded audio file, uh, this uses a command called say digits, and that takes a parameter which is just uh, a number, and it will read out the digits uh, in turn. So if I uh, load up microsip here, and I'm just going to dial the number, the extension that's assigned to this rule, which is five 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 zero zero three. Call that number. One two. Three, four. Okay, so uh, that can be useful if you want to read a uh, code or something like that. But at the moment, this one, two, three, four is uh, hard coded into the dial plan, so it's going to be the same every time. If we move on to example four, this does a similar thing, but there's a subtle difference. So my say digits command here, rather than having the number directly typed as a parameter to say digits, You'll notice what I've got here instead is this slightly odd syntax. So I've got a dollar and then the word number in brackets. So this is how you refer to a variable in asterisk. And the variable is actually being set on the line above it. So, um, so, so to step through the entire thing, we're answering the call just as we do always. The next command, which I've just noticed is missing one of those, uh, is to set the um, variable called number and it's going to set it to the value five six seven eight and then we're going to say what the value of number is so the reason for this uh, uh, dollar and then the brackets that says to basically to evaluate the value of anything that's contained in the brackets so it's saying rather than try to say the word number number is the name of the variable it's going to retrieve its value because it's contained in this and the value is five six seven eight so if i dial five 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 zero zero four five six seven eight there we go okay so that's uh interesting but that doesn't really add any more functionality compared to the previous file because i've still got the number hard coded it's just i'm setting it to a variable first and then i'm reading the variable let's move on to the next example so this time rather than declaring the number in the dial plan itself i'm using the file command to read a file on the uh the raspberry pi's sd card so if i load up win scp and just go to the uh user directory here you'll see I've got a file called number and if I edit that field you'll see it contains the value 13579 so with a bit of luck now we're turning here when I dial the extension number associated with this rule 13579 okay so it's read the contents of that file assigned it to the variable number and then read out that variable now the point about this is that this file here could be changed by any other process. So that could be uh, changed from someone accessing a website, it could be a value saved by another application, it could be written there by um, an Arduino or another device or something like that on the network. And whatever the value has at the point this number is called, that's what's going to be read out by say digits. Okay, that's all very well, but so far we've only read out numbers. So how do we get out to read um, other words or sentences and things like that? So for that, we need some text-to-speech software. Um, now, there's a couple of different approaches you can use for text-to-speech. There are online services, um, so the things you might have seen sort of from Google Cloud, um, Alexa and things like that. People are quite used to having text-to-speech in their houses these days. The problem with those services is... Uh, although they're very good quality and they sound quite realistic they do require an internet connection and they have an external dependency on that service working you've got to send the text to them and then um, wait for a response to come back and also you might not want to send um, your data to a third party service that you're not quite sure what they're recording or using it for so i'm going to use uh, a small library called um, pico tts instead that can be installed entirely on uh, the Raspberry Pi itself and runs totally offline and locally. It's not quite, it sounds a bit robotic, it's not quite as good um, speech quality, but it's perfectly usable. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is actually install Pico TTS. 
So to do that, I'm going to load up Putty and connect to my Raspberry Pi. Uh, log in as the root user. And then the uh, first package I'm going to install uh, is called libtts uh, pico0. And you'll see I've actually already installed it uh, on my machine once, so it's just checking whether to update it all again. But if you, if you haven't got it, that would uh, now newly install that. And the second package is the utilities that go with that. So we'll go apt get install lib tds pk dash utils this time. So those are the two packages that will actually install um, the pk tts library itself. Uh, there's one more thing we need, which is something called the asterisk gateway interface script or the AGI script. And that's a script, uh, a little bit like a, a CGI script, if you're familiar with those, um, that's going to enable you to actually call the Pico TTS engine from Asterisk. Uh, now, that's available on um, GitHub. Uh, so if you go to github.com forward stroke playful technology, and in the uh, Asterisk uh, Picots repository there, uh, you'll see this file here, Pico TTS dot AGI and if we access the raw version of that what you want to do is to save that file and then uh, using uh, winscp uh, what you need to do is copy that to the var stroke lib stroke asterisk stroke agi bin directory so we're going to drag that file which we just downloaded from github uh, into that folder there uh, you'll see there's some other AGI scripts and some PHP scripts. This is like the um, the folder of uh, scripts that Asterix can call from the dial plan uh, directly. And then the uh, the final thing we need to do is to actually set the permissions to make sure that Asterix can uh, execute this script. Uh, so if we we'll right click on that and we we'll go to properties and we're going to change the properties to be uh, executable by uh, all users on the system. Uh, so you'll see that that has changed the permissions there. Um, if you're doing that on the command line, that's a, a chmod command to uh, 0755. Sorry. Uh, now, having done all that, so we've installed the libraries, we've got the script and we've set the permissions. If we now come back to asterisk and remind ourselves what we're trying to do. So this is calling uh, that AGI script uh, and it's calling it using the AGI command. It's going to pass the text message to be spoken out, passed to Pico, and we're also just going to say the language in which uh, that needs to be spoken, which is going to help the engine with the pronunciation slightly. And uh, now if I call 555006. Hello, this is a message spoken by Pico. There we go. Okay, uh, now, uh, just as before, when we were using the say digits function, this does not have to be a static text string. So if we go on to the uh, next example, uh, we'll use some uh, other sorts of variables. So this is a built-in variable called epoch, um, which is like the amount of time, which is um, uh, the current time on the system. And f time is a way of formatting the time as a string. So this is going to take the hours and the minutes of the uh, current time and it's going to pass that to the function. So this is like a speaking clock. Uh, let's give it a try. The time is 9.28. And sure enough, the time is 9.28 at the time I'm recording this. Uh, so that's an example of how you can pass some uh, built-in variables uh, to PKTTS. Um, and also, just as we had a text file that had a number in it, which the say digits command could read, you can actually have a file with text in it, uh, which you can pass to PK to read. So again, we'll answer the call, we'll set a variable called data, and we'll set the value of that variable based on whatever the contents of this file here is. Uh, and then we'll read out. We'll say the contents of our is, and then we'll read whatever we found.
The contents of the file is a secret message. The contents of the file is a secret message, apparently. Well, uh, if we go to PKTTS, uh, sorry, if we go to WinSCP and uh, look at that secret message there, uh, we'll see, sure enough, the contents of the file was a secret message. Uh, if I now change that to um, another secret message, and we'll save that, and we'll dial the number again, The contents of the file is another secret message. So what's happened there? I haven't had to reload the dial plan at all because the dial plan's actually remained the same. I just edited this file outside of asterisk and because that file is read at the point the rule is followed, whatever the contents of that file is will be uh, what is read out. Okay, let's go for a different example. So we're sort of gradually increasing the complexity with each of these examples as to what happens. So what we've got here, this this line here looks uh, horrible. Um, so I'm just going to have to try to break that down bit by bit to explain what's going on here. So in all the examples so far, I've set uh, what's called a channel variable or a local variable. So this data line here is read in every time this rule is followed and when the call is hung up at the end um, this this call is over and the data is not remembered it's re uh, set on every occasion but sometimes you want to have variables that uh, persist uh, so that every time uh, the phone number is called it can remember what the value was set last time and it is uh, saved between calls so to do that uh, you can use this global keyword here. So in this example, I'm setting a, a variable, I'm calling it counter, and I'm declaring it as a global variable. So this is going to be a counter that remembers every time it's incremented and it persists that value between calls. So uh, this line here, though, the very first time the number is called, that counter variable won't exist at all. So uh, what this line here does, this is something called a, a ternary construct. So it's going to do uh, a little expression here and it's going to say, okay, does the counter variable exist? If it exists, then we're going to execute this bit of code and we're going to say, okay, we'll make the counter variable uh, equal to whatever it is at the moment plus one. So add one on. If the counter variable doesn't exist, then we'll just set it equal to the value 1. So the very first time this number is dialed, we're going to set a global variable called counter equals to 1. If when this number is dialed, there's already a variable called counter, we're going to add 1 to whatever its value was. Okay, so that's the first thing we're going to do. And what I want to do at the ultimate, the end of this script, I want to read out the number of times this call has been made, or this number has been dialed, rather. Um, so the first time I want to say, you've called this number one time. In all the subsequent times, I want to say, you've called this number two times, or three times, or four times. So I need to change the word on the end. If, if count is only equal to one, I want to say time. And if it's anything greater than one, I want it to say times. Uh, so that's what this line does here. So uh, this time I'm setting a local channel variable called plural. And if we've called this number any more than once, I want to have the value times plural. And if it's only equal to once, I want it to have the value time. So we've got two different variables going on here. I've got the counter itself, that's a global variable. And then I've got a local variable called plural, and that's going to be a word that's either times or time, depending on what the value of this one is. Okay, so finally, let's give it a try. So I'm going to dial 555008. You have called this number one time. Okay, I've called this number one. Let's now dial it again. 008. You have called this number two times. Okay. So, and we'll just do it a couple more times, just for fun. So you see it says times at the end. You have called this number three times. Excellent. 
And maybe uh, you want to put another test in that sort of says if the count of reaches a certain uh, value, then something different happens on the call. Um, you might also want to be able to reset the counter at various points, because otherwise it's just going to keep on going forever. So that's what the uh, next section here does. So if we dial this number, what's going to happen is it sets the global counter to just a null value, which is basically uh, resetting it. So if I dial 555-0080. Now notice that I didn't actually send any response to the call on this time. So we answered the call did an action and then hung up, which is why you didn't hear any message at all. Uh, if I now go and dial the original script again, we should be back to one time on the counter. You have called this number one time. There we go. Okay, uh, so this is getting you know more complex logic here, but I hope that you can see some of the, um, the different functionality that it's possible to get. Um, Here's another, this is a, a shorter example, but again, it's something that you might find useful. Um, perhaps you want to not only dial the number, but have to enter some kind of passcode or something before given uh, the following message. And for that, you can use this authenticate function. So authenticate takes a parameter in brackets, and that's going to be the number that the user will have to dial on the keypad before continuing down uh, the rules in the dial plan. So if it are 555009, I'll get prompted for a password. Please enter your password, followed by the pound key. Uh, and if I dial an incorrect password, so uh, just hit some random keys. Password incorrect. Please enter your password, followed by the pound key. And I'll get three chances to get that wrong, so I can get it wrong again. Password incorrect. Please enter your password, followed by the pound key. If I now enter the correct password, which is just one, two, three. Thank you. This highway leads to the shadowy tip of reality. I'll get a weird message. Uh, and that was another inbuilt sound file that was TT code zone. So uh, the script will stall on this point uh, until the correct password is proceed, uh, entered, and then it will proceed to here. Okay, example 10. So not only can we uh, play back messages and listen for user input on the uh, keypad, but we can also actually record what they say and play it back later as well. So for this one, uh, I'm going to ask the user a question, and then I'm going to use the um, record command here to record their response. Uh, I'm going to store it uh, in this location here uh, and I'm going, to I'm going to store up to a maximum of two seconds of response but if there's silence for any more than a second I'll stop recording anyway and this cue for quiet mode normally when you um, speak into one of these kind of voice recognition things there's a little beep on the tone to let you know that you're uh, being recorded but I'm actually going to use quiet mode so that uh, that beep doesn't play and then I'm going to uh, say a little bit more text and then I'm going to play back uh, whatever they said and this recorded file with a dollar behind it again this is a an automatically set variable from the system and it will give me the file name of the most recent recording made so let's try this one out 555010 so tell me what's your favorite color uh it's green okay so your favorite color is uh, it's green. There you go. That's a bit of an odd example, but um, that just gives you uh, use of the record command there. And you can record either segments of or, you know, entire sections of conversation and pass them off to other scripts to do with as well. Um, okay, and here is example 11. So this is um, my final example in this section. Um, so for this one, up to now, we've always been using the uh, from internal custom context. And what that means is that uh, any extension that is defined within that context is going to be matched when someone dials it um, from an internal number. Now, for this example, I've actually defined a uh, different context, though. I've got custom submenu here. And the first thing that's going to happen when the call is answered on 555 011, 
we're going to use the go to command and we're going to place the call into this context instead. Now the reason for that is because um, I want the user to press a single key and I'm going to, to I'm going to invite them to press a number I'm going to wait for them to press a number and then I'm going to tell them the number that they pressed which is going to be stored in this extend variable. Now to do that I'm going to uh, use a new dial pattern here that I haven't used before. Up to now I've always matched an exact pattern of numbers that the user has to dial. But here, because I don't know what key they're going to press, I'm just going to wait for any single digit. And that's what uh, this pattern here does. So this is going to match any single digit that's dialed. I'm going to tell them what they pressed. Now, if I'd place this in the context of from internal custom still, the problem is that this pattern here would be matched every time the user started to dial any number um, because it would just take the first digit of the number they were dialing and this rule would run uh, for anything that was dialed. So by placing the call into the custom submenu context first though, I'm only going to match that single number dialed if I was already in this context. So this is now sort of getting quite complex now in terms of sort of matching behavior and the different rules you can follow. But it's possible to pass calls around uh, different contexts and to have different rules run depending on what context they're in at the moment. But let me let me show you it in action. So I'm going to go five 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 zero one one. Place that call. Press a number. So. You are unaware that the call was passed into the custom submenu context, but it happened. And when it did, the first thing we were doing was to prompt it to press a number. Uh, now, what's actually happened there is that because I took too long to press a number, the wait extend command has timed out. Um, there is a, a limit here which you can change, but to sort of to make sure that the call doesn't get hung forever on the system and you have sort of tons of open calls, there is a there is a limit here. So I'm gonna try that again. Five for five A one one. Press a number. And this time I'm gonna press an extension and we should find it drop into this rule here. You press five. Now get lost. Okay, so I pressed five while I was still within the time limit for this command. And then the five matched this pattern here because it was a single digit uh, and the extend variable was used to tell me what number I pressed and then the call was hung up. So now you've seen some of the main asterisk functionality you can achieve uh, in those rules in the dial plan. So you can record calls, you can wait for user input, you can play back messages, you can uh, play back text to speech, you can have variables and you can combine those elements together into quite complicated rules that have um, branching logic and all these things. So um, I please encourage you to go away and, and play with that and make that into uh, interesting examples. All of the uh, applications I've shown you in this video have been about um, calls being made by a user to an extension and then having some kind of interaction. In the next video, what I'm going to look at is how you can make incoming calls um, that the player has to answer and how you can trigger those from external events and using other hardware such as Arduinos and things like that. So I hope you found this video helpful and uh, hopefully you can join me for that one next time. Thanks very much for watching.